Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in studio with my intrepid colleague, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And we've got Benny the Engineer in-house. And uh, thanks for listening. Just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our channel, either on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, however you consume it. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please spread the word. Uh, please uh, you know, keep on uh, sending us messages and comments, and we try to address them as fast as we can. And also, I just want to remind, especially our newer audience members who found us through YouTube, um, we have about, what, 20, 30 episodes on YouTube, something like that. But um, we've been doing this podcast for, what, four years? So there's a lot of other content out there that's just audio. And so please uh, go back and dig into the archives, either on Spotify or Apple, whatever. Um, and, and we have a lot of cool episodes, episodes we did with really big guests, Michael Francis. Um, George Young. Yeah, uh, George Young in studio. George Christie. George Christie, right. So um, just a lot of other topics, inter- things that I think y- you may find interesting. So please check us out and please spread the word. We did a really cool Sopranos episode with uh, Bobby Fernaro. Yeah, played, right. Gene, Portico- uh, Gene Pontecorvo. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, we had an exclusive interview with Big Pete from the Outlaws. Our Outlaw Biker episodes have been popular lately. Um, so please check that out. Uh, today is just going to be Bernie and I in studio, but uh, we've got some fun topics, and we're going to start off with, uh, before we get into our major topic, which will be the Detroit Mafia's involvement in the international heroin trade, uh, we'd just like to go over the poll results on YouTube. It's a fun way to interact with our audience members and to engage with our audience members. So there are three polls in the last few weeks that we haven't discussed yet, and I'll I'll run through them and we'll see what uh, what Scott and Benny think. I'll go over the results. One I posted a few weeks ago was which Irish gangster is the most compelling? And the five choices were Danny Green, who was uh, a Cleveland uh, labor racketeer. Jimmy Burke, who was uh, an Irish gangster associated with uh, Lucchese crime family. Jimmy Coonan, who was associated with the Westies. Uh, that was what Hell's Kitchen, West Side of New York uh, gang. Frank Sheeran, which the movie The Irishman was made about him, and then Whitey Bulger. So the results that came in overwhelmingly, Jimmy Burke w- w- is in the lead over 50%. Uh, Danny Green comes up second with around 20%, then Whitey Bulger just below that. Jimmy Coonan at 8%, and then Frank Sheeran just 2%. So um, Jimmy- I, don't, I don't know, Ben, you might not be as familiar with these Irish gangsters, but. But Scott, what do you think about these? I, um, I would say that Jimmy Burke, uh, his reputation and the mythology around Jimmy Burke was accelerated, augmented, complemented by the fact that Robert De Niro played you in yeah. an iconic movie. So uh, you don't even have to say Jimmy Burke. You just say Jimmy the Gent, and everybody knows who you're talking about. In the movie, his, his name is Jimmy the Gent Conway, but everybody knew he was talking about Jimmy Burke. So- when you're immortalized on the silver screen the way that Jimmy Burke was, and there's been movies about Whitey Bulger, and there's been movies about Danny Green, but not to the extent um, the way that Goodfellas resonated with not just you know the masses and pop culture, but with the, the you know the c- cinematic community. Uh, you know, to me, it's the I've said it on here before. I mean, it's the the perfect movie. Um, from from beginning to end, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I don't know if there are even the Godfathers. I can pick apart here, you know, little nips and tucks that yeah. I might have made. Right. Um, but uh, so I just think being a part of that movie, uh, right. what movie? <laughs> Goodfellas. You know, with the Robert De Niro character is just you know it's it's seared in people's heads. Right. So to me, that like it gives you like if if this was a race, you know, <laughs> like the, the Jimmy Burke. Uh, choice or or the election or what have you, uh, Jimmy. If if we were if we had him at the starting blocks, just having Robert De Niro having played you in a movie, he has an g- advantage. Gives you you know gives you a, a couple leg head start in my opinion. Who would you pick though? For, for I would have picked Danny Green. To me, uh, the story of Danny Green in the seventies in Cleveland, and there's a a, a pretty good movie called uh, To Kill the Irishman, um, which was actually shot in Detroit, but yeah. takes place in Cleveland um, with Ray Stevenson. Uh, playing Danny Green. It's, it's a good cast. Uh, Christopher Walken is in it. Val Kilmer's in it. Uh, I I think the story itself is probably better than the film, mm-hmm. but the film 
does it justice. And you know, for for people that don't know, you know, Danny Green was an Irish mobster, labor racketeer in the '70s that decided to challenge the Italian mafia uh, for you know the rackets in Cleveland and went toe to toe with these guys for a good two. Two three years before had them he on was the ropes, eventually right? murdered, and yeah, had him on the ropes to the point where the Cleveland bosses were going to New York and asking for help, right? Um, and uh, just you know the the balls that this guy had, and the you know, I, I have uh, such a uh, such such tremendous amount of respect for anybody in any field that has ambition and uh, maybe even what could be looked at as outsized expectations for themselves, and then do. And then they do everything in their power to make that happen, and whether it be sports or in the business world or in what we study, uh, criminology. Uh, and, and I'm not saying Danny Green was a, a great human being <laughs> or anything, but uh, he, he definitely had this idea that uh, in the late 70s, an Irish mob organization could unseat an Italian group that had been there for 100 years. And he almost, you know, he came close to doing it. Yeah, and if I uh, if I recall, he initially he was on good terms with the Italians. Yeah, he worked, he worked with them. them. He worked, with and them. then he started to think, well, why why should I settle for this secondary role? Uh, well, then when, there was a know, there was a change over. There was a change in leadership uh, in the Cleveland Mafia. Another thing that ignited this uh, Irish Italian mob war. He was uh, Danny Green was was everything was copacetic when John Scalish was the boss and. Uh, Danny Green was very close to Scalish's underboss, uh, Frankie Brancato. And uh, when Scalish died and Jack White Licavoli came into power, Angel Leonardo, uh, Leo Lips uh, Mosheri came into power, they did not get along with Danny Green. And Danny Green had had, him on, had a level of respect for, for Scalish that he did not have for the group that came in in 1976, which was Licavoli and Mosheri. And, and didn't uh, some and weren't there even some Italian guys who also didn't like the leadership and and yeah. actually sided with yeah, Nar- Danny Green it was John almost Nar- like a civil war yeah in John a way. Nardi who yeah. was an Italian labor racketeer whose family had been in La Cosa Nostra but he wasn't uh, a made guy but was kind of the equivalent of a made guy and he aligned with Danny Green right yeah and he was killed and then Danny Green uh, his. Mentor in the mob, uh, in addition to Frankie Brancato, was a Jewish racketeer named Shandor Burns, who Christopher Walken plays in the movie. And uh, eventually, Shandor sides with the Italians against him, and he kills Shandor, right. blows him up. And it was a lot of car bombs. Yeah, bombing campaign. Yeah. Yeah. And then Danny Green himself was uh, killed in a car bomb, I believe, in fall of 77. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I would pick... Um I guess I would pick. I know this is the obvious choice, and maybe it's cliche, but I I would pick Whitey Bulger. And I, I obviously he was a piece of shit, and he was a, a, a you know a rat and all that. But I'm I'm not again. I'm not judging this based on virtue. <laughs> like they're all bad guys. But I just think you know Boston, the whole thing, Southie. It's compelling. It's compelling. It's just it's like Hoffa. It's yeah, like it's the story right. will never die. Exactly. We'll be talking about it's Whitey so Bulger a hundred years from now. Right. Right. Um, he's like Billy the Kid or Jesse James. Yes. Right. And, uh, and there's a reason good way for to put it. it. Right. Yeah. Good way to put it. So I would pick him. But if I, if I had to pick a second person, Danny Green could be there. But I don't know. I I like Jimmy Coonan. I, I think the Westies are sometimes overlooked. And yeah. um, underappreciated, I think uh, they were aligned with the Gambinos, and they had a lot of juice, and they were pretty violent. And um, shout so. out to st- the movie State of Grace, where Ed Harris plays a character loosely based on Jimmy Coonan. Uh, one of the more underrated gangster movies, I think, uh, that's ever been put out. Sean Penn, Gary Oldman, Robin Wright Penn. Uh, Sean Penn plays an undercover FBI agent that had. Grown up with these Irish mobsters, and then he had left town and gone and been a cop in Boston, and then comes back and pretends like he's been kicked off the force when in reality he's right. going undercover into the uh, Irish mafia in New York. And uh, I, I just Gary Oldman g- gives an outstanding performance, and it's the movie that Sean Penn met his wife on, which is no longer his wife, but it's, <laughs> uh, Robin Wright. I didn't realize that. Um, so I would say, and I'm not surprised that Frank Sheeran is here at the bottom because I put him in there because, I mean, they made, Scorsese made a fucking movie about the guy. I, I, I should at least see what people think. But I think uh, at, le- at least, you know, we've we've talked about it on our channel. 
And I know some people disagree with that, but we've made the case that that's that story is not only inaccurate at times, but vastly overstated how significant he was. So I'm not surprised to see Frank Sheeran at the bottom of this list because I think more people are finding out that. I think it will be interesting. You know, he wasn't as big of a deal as. Um, I think it will be interesting. Oh, gabagool. I think it will be <laughs> interesting. Roberto just brought in some gabagool <laughs> for us. <laughs> what are we, a Satriali? Gra- grazie. Yeah, ma- grazie. Mario. Yeah, grazie. Side Mario. <laughs> Uh, the gabagool. Yeah. The gabagool. <laughs> I think uh, we can move on. The, the the final point I'll make is we were talking off air. Uh, Benny was, was talking about it. And it will be interesting to see, I think, how the Irishman ages, how that film ages, and how that movie looks five years from now or ten years from now. Um, and I think that will, in some ways decide how Frank Sheeran is viewed yes. you know, historically. Because we great, always see, we see, you know, we see, you know, history a lot through a lens of pop culture. And that's why we always try to insert it into a lot of our conversations. But I, I think it's valid here in both what we're talking about, Jimmy Burke and, and Robert De Niro, uh, his character in the movie helping, um, you know, enhance or amplify the Jimmy, uh, Jimmy the Gent Burke, the, the real life persona. And then yeah. I think with Sheeran, I think uh, I, I'm interested from a personal point of view what I'm going to think when I sit down, maybe even in a couple of weeks from now, because it's been two years now removed from The Irishman. I haven't watched it yeah. since it came out. I only watched it and I should do I should do a rewatch, whether it be this, uh, you know, in 2022 or or, uh, you know, in the new year. But uh, I'm interested to see how that how that movie ages. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So the second example here is. Of these recently deceased Cosa Nostra heavyweights, who is the most compelling? So I, I've picked five big names, people that have died within the last roughly four or five years. Frank Cali, who was uh, in the Gambino crime family. Anthony Casso, gas pipe, who was uh, underboss at one point in the Lucchese crime family. John Nonos DeFranzo, who was the boss of the Chicago Outfit. Sonny Francis, who was, uh, wasn't the boss, but he was certainly a high-ranking member of the Colombo crime family. And then speaking of that, Carmine Persico, the snake, was the fifth choice. And the numbers broke out. Um, the, the biggest uh, lead here, Sonny Francis, almost 50%. So, again, another poll that's kind of one-sided here. Uh, you have Frank Cali and Carmine Persico tied for second at almost 20%. Gas pipe comes in uh, fourth with 13%, and then DeFranzo uh, last 6%. I, I have a feeling that's part of it is just Chicago versus four New York guys. He just, the Chicago guy might just, he didn't have really a chance, but I, I tried to mix it up so it wasn't all New York guys. So, what do you think? Who would you? I mean, would you I would have picked the Chicago guy. Yeah. Uh, but again, I'm biased. My research uh, is, is very. Um, Outside of the five families, the, sure. I mean, the majority of my research and my expertise, uh, not to say that there's anything wrong with studying the five families, because that's where, that's where it all began. It's and the there's, so, there's so many people that, that research and study and report on the five families. I wanted to make a name for myself, uh, you know, going after the, the, the smaller organizations and, and, and getting those things all buttoned up uh, from, a, from a research and, uh, and a expert, you know, expert perspective. So, you know. Chicago is a is a is an area that I've written quite a lot about. I lived in Chicago for a decade. Um, I worked in the uh, Illinois Attorney General's office, work in some mob cases when No Nos DeFranzo was the boss, uh, and uh, I just find his. There's so many things about No Nos DeFranzo. Uh, that's a lot of that we know, and there's a lot of stuff I, I think that we don't know for sure, and yeah. that's what makes him uh, such a riveting character, especially when you, you, you think about the guy lived until, I think he died in 2018 or 19. Um, but uh, I, I I believe... We recorded a whole episode on him. Yeah, I, I, I believe pretty strongly that, that he was a, a confidential informant and uh, had used his, his ties with the FBI to stay in power. And, and that's how he averted uh, arrest in, in the family secrets case in 2005. So I just find that, you know, the politics involved in his rise to power and his ability to stay in power uh, for, you know, almost 30 years, 30 years, roughly um, in an era where most mob bosses are, no. are gone in a couple, yeah. two or three years, they get picked up 
Yeah. If you last five to ten years, you're you're doing really well for yourself, and and no nos lasted thirty plus. Yeah, as soon as you're the boss, you're it, it's not long usually before you're you're taken down. So out of the New York guys, who would you pick? So who would be Sonny. your second? Okay, Sonny Francis. Really? Okay. I, I, I think we've done this before on the show. You know, you, you play the what if game, and uh, you know Sonny Francis could have easily become a godfather, and I think. If if Francis doesn't get caught up in that bank robbery case in the late sixties, he becomes boss of the Columbos in the nineteen seventies mm. instead of Junior Persico. And he was, you know, that rare trifecta we always talk about. Loved, feared, respected. Yeah. An earner and a hitter. Yeah, right. Uh and, and Sonny Francis just checked all those boxes. And I, I think if he became boss of the Columbos in the 70s, you wouldn't have had any of the acrimony that you had under Persico with uh, uh, the big war in the 90s. And uh, it just, I just, I think it would, it's a fascinating what if scenario. Yeah, well, that's good. That's a good point. I would pick, uh, you know, my research, I'm very much interested in transatlantic networks between the, the Italian uh, American mafia and the Sicilian mafia. So for me, it's not even close. It's uh, Frankie Boy Cali for me. Uh, he, I mean, he's he's one of the to me most compelling. I mean, that, that's exactly the kind of guy that I like to research and I'm interested in. Uh, he was related to the Cherry Hill Gambinos, uh, the the uh, Inzerillos, uh in 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 Palermo, and um, and you know he was considered a zip even though he was actually born. In, he became in the a, and became a boss at a really young age, right. Of a yeah. New York crime family. Uh, another guy that you know, we're, we're the trifecta there. You know, I, I I didn't know many people that didn't respect the guy. Yes, I, I didn't know many people that didn't think he was a, a not just a, a great leader, but someone that uh, was a man of the people. Um, yes, he he got along with the rank and file. He got along with the 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 OGs. He got along with the BGs. Yeah, and um, he was a On guy both that continents. right. And, and I think if there's a <laughs> You know, if, if I was doing my my pluses and minuses here, I, I give him a minus for something that he had no control over, and and that minus would be, you know, his demise was semi was somewhat anticlimactic. Uh, it, I probably would be more interesting or more interested if we if we were now you know three four years removed from when he got killed, and it, it had been a big power play within the Gambino crime family, which a lot of people thought at first that, you know, the Sicilians had taken over and some of the old Gotti regime was coming out of prison Took him out. in the in the 2010s. And the, but that's not what happened at all. Uh, it, it came down to one of his nieces was dating a mentally ill yeah. individual who saw uh, killing Frankie Boy Cali as, as some, like, uh, you know, words from God or or uh, yeah. you know, voices in his head. So yeah, the, yeah, he's the only one on the list who died from unnatural causes. Right. He was he was murdered, but it turns out it wasn't at least at least as of right now. It seems like it had nothing to do with with organized crime. But but I think in a lot of ways his leadership helped stabilize the Gambinos post Gotti, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I I would pick him. And then Junior um, I mean, with Junior Persico, I mean the. the I don't have to uh, – this is not something we need to belabor the point with, but whether you liked him or hated him, the fact is Junior Persico was a, a godfather of one of the five families for roughly 45 years. Yeah. And, and 42 of them were in prison, and he was able to keep control of that family from behind right. bars for almost a half century – yeah, it, it the last mob dynasty that really exists is that Persico Colombo mob dynasty, and I, I think there's some merit to that from a socio, you know, academic viewpoint to to see that he, even though he was a, you know, very polarizing. Yeah, you know, someone that was a lightning rod. You either were fiercely loyal to him, or you thought he was. You know the devil incarnate. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's interesting about those Colombo guys, Francis and Persico, on this list is they were also this sort of bridge between the real old timers like Profaci mm -hmm. and and Gallo and Colombo, and then the the guys who are around now, and that that also adds a kind of I think mystique to you know to, to it, their legacies. And it should be noted that in Sonny Francis's book. 
that was released right after he passed. He did a uh, interview with S.J. Petty and Newsweek, who turned that into a book. Uh, he was pretty adamant at the end of his life that Carmine Persico was a a cooperator, and that had been feeding the information had been feeding the government information against him. Right. Yeah. Right. To, to keep him, you know, from ever reaching a point where he could take over as boss. Yeah, we did an episode on that too, and that's pretty controversial because obviously not everyone there, there's all sorts of debate about misinterpreting the the, do, the actual documentation. Yeah. Not 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 regardless of what he thinks that the documentation there. Yeah, there, and that's separate. But that's separate. There yeah, was, right, there was right. some documentation right. that uh, Daily. Uh, I don't remember. If it I don't was remember the, the New York. Paper, I think but... it was the Post. The Post had had published. And there were some questions about where that stemmed from. But I think Sonny's uh, conversation with Petty had come before that document was was. That's was a good public. point, yeah. He was kind of uh, riffing yes. on, on uh, his, his thoughts on, on people that were uh, forces pulling against him. Yes. Because there were quite a few. Yes. And that that's interesting because I, my understanding is always politically Francis was aligned with Persico. But, you know, behind the scenes, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean yeah. very much in right. this world. So the last poll that we did, this one, uh, Benny might want to jump in on, too, is what is your favorite drug lord gangster film? So I, I picked five, you know, classics from the last whatever, 40 years. So your five choices were American Gangster, which was with Denzel Washington uh, about Frank Lucas Blow, which we mentioned George Young earlier, we had him in studio, uh, who was connected to the Medellin cartel. Carlito's Way, which was a totally fictional movie, but starring Al Pacino, Sean Penn. New Jack City, which was Wesley Snipes. Uh, that was a great cast, too, about an African-American drug lord in New York City. Um, some of it based on Detroit and the Chambers Brothers. And then Scarface, uh, the lat we all know Scarface, Al Pacino about uh, Cuban drug lords in Miami. So the, here are the numbers again: a one-sided poll, Scarface over fifty percent. Wow. Um, then you got American Gangster and Blow around fifteen percent each. Oh. Carlitos Way eleven percent, and New Jack City at the bottom at five percent. So uh, go ahead, Ben, jump in, then Scott, and then we'll, Roberto put in his two cents. I don't know if he's coming back into the studio, but we'll talk about his two cents here too. What What do you think, Ben? What, how would you rank this? Well, I don't have a mic, but... Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that, but... Um, I, I think it's a travesty that uh, uh, America Gangster got that low. I, I, I know everybody, you know, uh, Scarface is uh, culturally famous, but, uh, you know, people have said it all the time. At the time, it was a flop. Yeah, that's a good point. That was a movie that we were talking about how a movie ages. Yes. That movie was not considered a classic at all until about 10 years later. Yeah, good point. Good points. So you would say, Ben, you would pick American Gangster, or what would you, what would you pick uh, for your number one? Of the best film? Yeah, your favorite drug lord gangster film. My favorite, I would probably have to go probably with Blow. With Blow, okay. Ben's the, going with the Blow. The most badass gangster, though, of those is Frank Lucas, at least the way Denzel portrayed him. Right. See, so that's how, that's so that's, interesting. that's interesting. Your favorite character, not necessarily your favorite film, yeah. but your favorite character. Yeah, that of... scene with the Dries Elba is iconic. Yeah. No, yeah. his performance was amazing. Yeah, he's great. And and I've told the story, yeah, I think. Shooting me for all these <laughs> I think I've I've told the story on the pod, and I told it to to Ben uh, off air. You know, my love affair with the with the movie American Gangster has been a <laughs> rocky road. <laughs> uh, it's like a marriage that starts off yeah. really uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> lots of fighting and acrimony, and then ends up uh, you know on a beach in the Bahamas, living happily <laughs> ever after. I did not like that movie at first because. I was someone that knew the history, and that movie does not stick to to the history and kind of creates its own history and kind of creates its own uh, 1970s Harlem drug world where Frank Lucas, uh, you know, uh, the the skeletal sketch of Frank Lucas, um, definitely that was accurate. But when you filled in the blanks uh, with the with the screenwriting and the and you coloring it up. Uh, as a film, 
they, there was a lot of creative liberties taken. So at first, I had an issue with that, and it blinded my ability to like the movie. But now I consider it one of my all-time favorites. The more I, the more I get removed from the movie, the more I love it. Whenever it's on television, I have to watch it. Such a mesmerizing performance by Denzel, and just I just have to tell myself that the Frank Lucas that he's playing is not the real Frank Lucas. It's like a, a yes. another al- alternate, alternate reality universe. version yeah. of Frank Lucas, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, he, because he Denzel, the way I viewed it, and I, I love the film too, is that uh, he, he basically is like this black Michael Corleone, and I, I, I don't think the real Frank Lucas he was, was not sophisticated at all. Right, and he was conspicuous. The point is Denzel plays it as like um, uh, uh, understated, yeah. uh, you know, off the radar, down, uh, on the DL. Savvy, <laughs> sophisticated, <laughs> right. crafty, clever, right. slick. Right. And, and Frank Lucas was not slick. Yeah. Frank Lucas was a country bumpkin. Yeah. And that's why they called their group the Country Boys. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's Mickey right. Mickey Barnes, who they, in the movie, they portray almost in a minstrel manner. It almost was offensive, the way they portray the Mickey Barnes character by Cuba yeah. Gooding Jr. He was the sophisticated, savvy one. Yes. Not, not out there acting a fool the way they made him uh, appear to be in that movie. Yeah, I mean, and also like just uh, again, the history was was off. Like Frank Lucas, th- there's obviously truth that he established connections in Asia to bypass the Italians, but he never had this like exclusive autonomy. In fact, even at the very end, Frank Lucas owed the Italians a lot of money, yeah. and and the Italians were quite possibly going to kill him <laughs> at one point. So uh, there, there's some mixture, but I, I still, I, I agree with you both. I, I, it's a great character. It's a great film. Um, so what would you pick? My as your first favorite? one would be Carlito's way. Carlito's and that's way. probably the, a sleeper pick. I love Scarface and there's nothing, you know, to me, Scarface is like uh, the way that Goodfellas is to mob movies, Scarface is to drug dealer movies. It's the pinnacle. It's at the top of the mountain peak and, and, uh, Hard to top, even though as we were as we mentioned, it wasn't a movie that was uh, embraced right away. Mm-hmm. It was really em- uh, the fact that drug dealers themselves embraced it mm-hmm. made the movie more popular amongst yes. the the Excellent the everyday uh, everyday uh, audience, the everyday consumers, especially the hip hop community, yeah. gangster rap, I should say. But I, I Carlito's way to me is so underrated, uh, more of a slow burn. Um, it's not as fast paced. There's some definitely some fast paced scenes, but it, it's it's classic noir. It's it's a movie that was made in the '90s, but maybe could have been made in the '40s with the way that the uh, the filmmaking was. And I think that was intentional. De Palma, uh, who who directed Scarface mm-hmm. and also directed Carlito's Way, mm-hmm. and there's a number of uh, characters that are uh, or actors that play characters in both movies. Mm-hmm. That's right, and. Um, I just I just love Carlito's way. I think it's it's uh, Pacino's most underappreciated uh, gangster role. Yeah, it's it's not going to be my choice. But if I one of my favorite lines ever in a in a crime or gangster film is Carlito saying, "You think you're like me? I run with made made guys, guys. connected guys. Go snatch a purse. <laughs> Who do you run with? Yeah, yeah, person. Yeah, right. My, that just—it's it, just one of my favorite scenes and and lines. And and there's so many other good ones. And there's Sean Penn is great. Um, I would pick, and we'll we'll see what Roberto thinks here too. I would pick again. Maybe it's cliche. Uh, maybe it's lame. But I'm going with Scarface. I mean, it just so it's so big. It's so it's so larger than life. There's so many great scenes. So many great lines. The cultural impact of it. It's up there with the Godfather films. Not, and not, uh, not and so it, I just like, love it. Not so much the gangster stuff, but if you're going by drugs. I'm going by the movie that you see the most white powder in. <laughs> so that's going to be Scarface. It's going to be Blow. Um, and, and that's what does it for me. You, yeah, I, I would. I mean, I love all five of these uh, movies. I think all of us agree. New but, Jack City know. is a movie I think that has gotten lost in regards to the the millennials. Yes. I think they'll watch Scarface. They'll watch Goodfellas. Uh, New Jack City is a little bit more dated. It's very specific to that yeah. time period. The fashion. 1990, the music. <laughs> 1991. Yeah. The classic in the black America. Yeah. 
but it's not considered a classic. Overall. Overall. I think that's yeah. true. Probably. Yeah, and it should it, it should be, I think. Show five. <laughs> Before I make change. Uh, yeah, there's great line yeah, there's great lines there, but I, I love Wesley Snipes. No, it's it's great, but I, I think you're right. The the fashion and the um mm. soundtrack gives it a dated kind of feel, whereas the other movies for whatever reason just didn't it's immersed in New Jack one, Swing music, is why it's called yeah. New Jack Swing. Which City. we like, right? The three that, of us. <laughs> what, what I'd say a more accurate movie would be like Paid in Full, do you think? Well, Paid in Full was a, a was like a real story. That's yeah, the real story. Yeah, I mean, the real story of, 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 uh, of Rich Porter and uh, Alpo yeah, and, right, and, talk, and, yeah. and AZ Faison. Uh, New Jack City, I mean, we have a special connection to it being from Detroit. New Jack City. The screenplay is based or inspired from, taken from an article written in the Village Voice, which was written by uh, Barry Michael Cooper, who was the writer direct or writer of New Jack City. He had come to Detroit in 1987 and embedded for uh, I think three or four weeks with the Chambers Brothers mm -hmm. and wrote the 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 seminal article in the Village Voice called New Jack City Eats Its Young. Mm -hmm. And in that story that was optioned for a film, New Jack City wasn't New York City. No. New Jack City was Detroit. It was Detroit, yes. And the Chambers brothers and BJ Chambers and Larry Chambers became a, a composite for Nino Brown. Right. And they had the uh, the entire hotel and all right. that was that was based, based on, on the Carter, yeah. which was the, uh, the project that the Cash Money Brothers take over in New Jack City was inspired by the fact that the Chambers took over the Broadmoor, which was not a project. It was a, a, a historic apartment building. Right. And they just bum rushed that shit. Yeah, it was all and vice. W and went uh, went to all the apartments and basically said, yeah, we're moving in here. You're either going to ride with us or we're going to kick you out. <laughs> yeah. And it was either they were drug dens, prostitute, like a brothel. Yeah. It was like a, all it was like vice. A, a, a vice emporium, 24 <laughs> right, hours a day. Right. Right. Mm. And that was that was based on on that actual situation. So, well, it's a good segue. We're, we're talking about fav, favorite drug lord gangster films. We'll spend the next half an hour or so uh, talking about actual the actual drug trade and something that Scott and I are very interested in as researchers, and that's the the Italian mafia in Detroit and their involvement in in the global heroin trade. Um, it's something that I think uh, is underappreciated. And even now, I, I sometimes we get comments on. Um, I thought you know the the Detroit guys were buying from New York, and we make the argument that no, no New was York was actually, buying from right, Detroit. It's actually the other way around. So we'll un we'll unpack this a little bit and uh, go through some of the names and and we we actually co wrote a chapter together that you can find in Detroit True Crime Chronicles where we we it's a it's a lengthy chapter, but I I, um, I hope people find it interesting where we we really document a, a lot of this. And I would say it goes back to a lot of it is post World War II. At least we can start. I mean, we know the Italians were dealing opium even before that. But in terms of the Detroit Mafia being major players, we'll focus on the the post World War II era. And and I think the way we'll frame this is the reason why they were such significant players is three major factors, and we'll, we'll break down each factor. Number one is. The Detroit guys were very much connected to mafiosi in Sicily, which gave them an advantage over some of the other crime families. Second, you're near an international border, Windsor. Anytime you're near an international border, that will help your crime organization in terms of trafficking illicit and it, and it gives you a leg up on the competition around the country. Yes, because drugs were especially at that point before they were coming up, going from you know Mexico into the Southwest and, and the West Coast and then right. eventually making its way to the Midwest. Right. Back then when, when drugs were coming in from Europe, it was coming in the opposite direction. Yes. So it either right. was coming through the Windsor border, the uh, border uh, in Western New York, or the border, uh, you know, in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Right. So that that gave us a significant advantage. I say us. <laughs> Detroit, we're in Detroit. We weren't in the crime family, though. And uh, the third is uh, the connection that the Detroit guys had to the Teamsters and, and Jimmy Hoffa also played a significant role in terms of distribution yeah. and transportation of narcotics. And so then, well, I want yeah, to throw, throw in a fourth uh, reason, or I don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg here, but – the fact that the Detroit Dons had marital connections mm. at the 
at the forefront of the five families in New York. Great point, yeah. Uh, makes it so those business relationships are much easier to cultivate. Uh, Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko, who were the founding fathers of the mafia in Detroit, uh, married their respective uh, sons to the daughters of Joe Perfacci, the one of the original uh, dons of the five families. He was the kind of the archetype for Don Corleone and olive the oil Godfather. King. He <laughs> was the real olive oil king. Uh, to this day, uh, Calavita uh, olive oil uh, is, if not the most popular um, commercial olive oil uh, brand there is. It's one of the top two or three. Right. And that was started by the Profaci family uh, in the early 20th century. And through bootlegging endeavors, Joe Profaci and the Detroit guys became friendly. And then in the 19, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, uh, they cemented those business relationships by bringing together their families uh, in, in these semi-arranged marriages where Tony Zerilli, who would become the underboss, uh, Joe Zerilli's son married Rosalie Perfacci, and who was kind of the prototype for Connie Corleone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Tony Toko, Jack Toko's uh, baby son, married uh, Carmela, who they call Millie Perfacci. And both of the Perfacci sisters moved to Detroit in the early 1950s so, you know, the Colombo crime family, Joe Profaci, at that time was the Profaci crime family. Yes. Uh, and their first cousin was married to Bill Banana. Banana, right. So the network, it, it's really important, that networking. So there was a lot of traveling between Detroit and New York just for that family's sake, yes. which then dovetailed in, in, into business uh, and, and illegal activity. Yeah, and, and not just with, with drugs, but everything, labor racketeering yeah. and all, all sorts of things. So, so some of the significant names we'll point out, and, and you know, Scott will help describe these guys too, but I would start, at least in our chapter, we, we focus on three different groups, the, the Partinico group, the, the Windsor group, and the later on the Betelamente group. So with the Partinico group, we we there, there was a whole crew of guys, but we focused on well, just in the interest of time, the three big guys: Papa John Preziola, Jimmy Quasarano, and Frankie Three Fingers Coppola, Trey Ditti. And uh, I think that those are the three guys at the nexus of the heroin trade in not only not only Detroit but but globally. Yeah, <laughs> globally. So you want to tell us? I tell mean, I think about I think Coppola was made on both sides of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jimmy Quasarano, who was the protege of Papa John. Now, mm -hmm. Papa John uh, was 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 the the elder statesman. I mean, maybe not. I guess if we're talking about the twenties uh, and thirties, he was yeah. on his way up. But right. by the mid twentieth century, uh, into the sixties and seventies, he was the the kind of the patriarch of the American dope trade. Yes, and uh, very you know, Papa John um, was Joe Zerilli. Joe Zerilli's consigliere, mm -hmm. uh, the the counselor, the advisor to the to the Godfather of the Detroit Mafia from the 30s until he died in 1979. So you're talking about a uh, an administrator in mafia activities from the FDR administration <laughs> all the way up through a uh, Jimmy Carter uh, yeah. before Ronald Reagan takes over. Very respected guy. Yeah, on both sides again, both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, and so by the way, all three of these guys, I believe Quasarano too, but I know Preziola and Coppola. I'll have to fact check if Quasarano was there. But I know Prezio and Coppola were both at the infamous 1957 57. meeting yeah. in Palermo. With, Lu at, with Lucky Luciano. With Luciano and Joe Bonanno, where they basically organized the, the international heroin trade. So not every crime family in the United States had a representante at the, that meeting, but Detroit did, specifically Qu Priziola. So Quasarano, though, was Prezio's... But at that for, through the 30s and 40s, 50s, yeah. he was this a right bodyguard, hand. driver, right hand, liaison, proxy. Yeah, he, uh, he, Quasarano might have been there. I can't remember. I'd have to go back and check. But either way, so right away, you, there's evidence that that Preziola is a significant factor here. And so, and to tell people yeah, that Jimmy Quasarano, which which is a, a major enhancement to this business relationship of narcotics, he's married to a godfather's daughter yes. in Sicily, 
Yes, Vito Vitale, Don Vito, yeah. who is a member of the Castellamare um, uh, familia there. And um, so- Jimmy Quasarum. Jimmy Quasarano marries his daughter. Right. And his and by the way, you can see how this this labyrinth um one of Vitali's other daughters, the sister, is married to Badalamente. Right. <laughs> so it's all gonna it's all you'll need a score sheet again to, to tie this all together. So they've got the connections to Sicily. Two things really important. One, as you point out, Jimmy Q is married to Vito Vitale's daughter. But also Coppola gets deported in, what, 48 or 49, something like that, which, which by the way, it seems possible that actually Preziola and Quasar actually arranged that because they wanted to just get him out of the picture. Just get him out of the picture. They viewed it as better if he was just a, a drug supplier in in Sicily rather than uh, you know active in Detroit. But you know that, that, that it's kind of interesting. But anyhow, so Coppola gets deported either way, and um, he he basically is one of the most important individuals in organizing the heroin trade. And this is really an interesting case study in, in globalization before people were even talking about globalization. Uh, at, that t- at that time, most of the opium is coming from the Middle East, places like Iran, Turkey. Today, it's almost all coming from Mexico. But back then, it was coming from the Middle East. And that opium would make its way to Lebanese smugglers. And the Lebanese smugglers could speak French because it used to be a French colony. The Lebanese smugglers sell the opium to gangsters in Marseille. They can speak French. And the, Mar- the gangsters in Marseille sell the raw opium to the Sicilian mafia, and they've got the labs they process and the chemists. That, right. They can process it. into and package it and then smuggle it right. to the United States. Yeah, so they can pr- manufacture, or manufacture it, process it into heroin, street heroin, and and sell it to the Italian American crime families, who then they sell it to outlaw bikers, black organized crime groups, and so it's really this fascinating example of underworld globalization before people were even talking about. And they were actively putting out a. We talked about it in the Jimmy Hoffa thing, uh, in the Jimmy Hoffa conspiracy quite a bit. They were putting out a disinformation campaign. The mafia was going out of their way to tell everyone, oh, yeah. we don't do it. You know, we, 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 we do the type of uh, crime that you'd be proud of. <laughs> you know, we yeah. give people loans. They can't go to the bank for loans. We yeah. let people book Pro- bets. Protection, provide well, protection. Yeah, we protect the little guy <laughs> against the big guy. Someone that wants to lay a, you know, someone who uh, has a, a sporting manner can come and lay a bet with us. Someone that wants a, a woman's company for the evening can come find us. <laughs> but, but we don't, we don't go to the, you know, we don't, we don't go to the, the, the scourge of the, yeah. of the universe and, and spread uh, infamia. spread narcotics when in fact they were at the epicenter of spreading right. narcotics they just wanted to you know give lip service to this notion maybe thinking that the more they said it the more you know the the legislators and the police officers and the federal governments might believe it yeah yeah and and they were and they were smart enough to recognize that uh if they think people think they're involved in gambling and th- just like you see in the Godfather, these harmless vices, people might not make a big deal. But you start saying that they're global drug dealers. Now, all of a sudden, people might not think, oh, I- I'm not sure if these are good guys yeah. in the community. And they knew, how to, and they knew how to, and especially Detroit guys, they invented the concept of, of buffers and insulating yourself. But, you know, with the global narcotics trade, when it when it tied into the Italians, there were, you know, 10 pieces of the puzzle that you had to put together before you got to the head of the snake. Yes, yes, which was smart. I mean, guys like Papa John Priziola um, weren't touching no. heroin. They weren't no. anywhere in the presence of heroin, but they were making fortunes on heroin. No, they, they were arranging things, financing things. And um, actually, Priziola and Quasarano were tried in absentia in, in Italy for and convicted of right. heroin trafficking. But, the but, never, but never, would, never by the United States. No, the United States, United States, States government, them, never, or wouldn't United States government would never, never charge them with drug crimes. Yeah, right. Didn't extradite them. Papa John Priziola never did any prison time. They actually found... Uh, it's kind of interesting. I think in one of the raids in Italy, they found like um, you know all the like Papa John's address and things like that. So they were connected to those guys in in Sicily. Coppola was was arranging that, and another significant figure in in this network, a, a guy from Partinico who was Coppola's sort of rival, was Salvatore Vitale. 
This gets very confusing. Not to be confused with the Bonanno Salvatelli Messino's brother-in-law. But they're cousins. <laughs> yeah, and not to be confused with Vito Vitale from Castellamare. If you're not Italian, you might know, not know this, but Vitale is a very common, yeah. very common the name. The Sal Vitale that we're talking about was actually Papa John's son-in-law? Uh, no, the... the um, it's an indirect relationship because through the Matrangas. Okay. Through the Matrangas, which is another networking thing we did we didn't mention yet. But um the reason why I think this is interesting is Sal Vitale was was helping arrange some of this this narco trafficking. And he ends up at odds with the Preziola Quasarano Coppola uh faction. Triple triple however you want to think of that. And um there's there's Sal Vitale actually Threatens to kill Preziola and Quasarano, and he even says he'll kill Quasarano's family, family. in yeah. Partinico. So they're arranging a number of sit downs, including a sit down that involved Joe Zarilli. And they're try He went to San Diego because that's where Vitali was was holed up at was in San Diego, and they're trying to negotiate this, and they lure Sal Vitali. To Detroit, to a meeting in Detroit to where meeting, right. the Toco brothers, yes, yes, who uh, let's be very clear, they're they're both uh, have passed. Uh, Black Jack Toco and and his brother Tony T, aka Ton, um, you know they were uh, well. Jack was convicted of a racketeering. Uh, Tony was indicted in racketeering, but not convicted. Never have been uh, tied in any criminal litigation to homicides no but in testimony in front of the uh u.s senate jack toko was tied to a murder in 1947 uh, of a of a greek gambler in detroit named gus adromalus and i also believe in that uh same testimony i believe it was in the mcclellan uh hearings that the, I think it was George Edwards, who was the head of the Michigan State Police, went in front of uh, the committee and they were asked about Black Bill Toko. And he referenced that Black Bill Toko's sons were the last people seen with Sal Vital yes. before, Sal, before Sal Vital disappeared. Disappeared, right. So he comes to this meeting. They surveil them with the, with the Tokos. I think they go, to Windsor, they go to Windsor, and that's when they lost the trail of, the, yeah. and and Vitali was never seen was, from was never seen, and but everyone knew in the underworld that that Preziola and Quasron had him had him. Yeah, and the and the Toko brothers at that point would have been in their early thirties, maybe late uh, early thirties. Yeah, they would have been young, late twenties, early thirties. Yeah, and and so the 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 connection is, I believe Sal Vitali was married to a, a Matranga, and. Some of the Matranga, one of the Matrangas was married, married to, to Papa John's Preci right. daughter. So, so that one of the Matrangas, so his brother-in-law was the son-in-law of Papa John. Yeah. So he's he's going to Preziola and Quadrano saying, "Where's Sal Vitale? Like, what happened?" They and they told him, "Like, mind your own fucking business. <laughs> stop poking yeah. around. Stop. Stop asking." And it, it's a really interesting story. You can read our chapter. I mean, we, won't, we don't have to go over and everything, then, but at one point, there's a, a robbery, a, a hotel drug. The uh, they the uh, rob a guy of his drugs, Quadrano Preziola. And so it's a very interesting story leading up to to the disappearance of a, a guy who was an underboss in the Partinico yeah. uh, uh, familia, and then his. Cousin was Salvatore, good looking Sal Vitale, who was the underboss of the Bananos in New York yeah. and uh, cooperated and was the at one time the right hand man and brother in law of Joe Messino. Yeah, so it get, I admit it, get, it gets sort of confusing. But another reason why, so you have, you have Coppola has these ties in Sicily to these gangsters in Marseille and Middle Eastern gangsters. Coppola is also very politically connected. He's, he's, he's actually. Um, uh, has friends in the Vatican. He has friends in the Senate in 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 Rome in Italy. So he's very politically connected. Possibly, our friend El Prophet. You can watch some of the videos he's done. He's done. Um, there are a lot of allegations that Frank Coppola was also had connections to American counterintelligence, CIA, asset. CIA, CIA, yeah. which is probably true. And so he's a well connected guy, perfectly positioned to to transport these these narcotics to. To Preziola and Quasarano, and they're all they're all paisan from from Partinico, and 
But another key connection here is Coppola, Quasrano, and Preziola's connection to the team. Right, I was about to say. So, so when <laughs> we're talking really about important. distribution, <laughs> yes. and one of the questions that I get asked the most um, when I go do talks and, and when I'm doing my Detroit Mafia talk, I obviously devote quite a bit of time to Jimmy Hoffa, and people are just forever fascinated by the, uh, the story of Jimmy Hoffa, the rise and fall, the disappearance. But one of the first things people always ask me is, well, how did Jimmy Hoffa get linked into the Detroit Mafia? Well, you can trace it directly back <laughs> to Frankie Three Fingers Coppola, right. who uh, was really his his entry point, hundred percent into uh, not just you know affiliation and introduction to mobsters that could you know help his career, but also his entry point into the you know into the fast track up the Teamsters uh, elevator to to the penthouse. Yeah, so remember, Frank Coppola, Frankie Coppola is here. He's in Detroit before he gets deported, yeah. and he's here for a while. This was in the 30s. Right, and um, so this is his, his – and, and the, the person who introduces Hoffa to him is – Is Sylvia <laughs> Pagano, a.k.a. Sylvia Paris, <laughs> right. who was uh, a paramour, if you will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, an ingenue, <laughs> a muse, right. someone that a lot of mafia figures, not just in Detroit but in other major cities – um, kind of uh, would you know, kind of fall head over heels for, and she was on the arm of a lot of wise guys. Eventually, came to Detroit, and was having uh, romantic dalliances with Frankie Three Fingers Coppola, as well as Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. uh, some of the Jackalones got involved in that, and uh, her son was Chucky O'Brien. <laughs> right, who was right. one of the last people allegedly uh, to have seen uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Was, was, was Jimmy Hoffa's surrogate son, adopted son. Right. So, again, if you're connecting the dots, Chucky O'Brien's baptismal godfather is Frankie Coppola. Right. <laughs> and then his surrogate father is Jimmy Hoffa. And his surrogate <laughs> father number two was Tony Jacqueline. Right. So so through these connections, um Coppola gets deported so he can but now he can, you know, he can ship heroin to the United States. But Preziola and Quasarano now are positioned within the Teamsters. They have like their um, you know official positions, right? And they, they have and they got they have they control locals. Yes, they I mean, can, Hoffa yeah. would give out but locals. But formally, formally, yeah, they right. had rank. They yeah. had rank, actual titles. It wasn't like behind the scenes on the town level. I, I think a very, very, very underappreciated uh, aspect of Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters. Well, Jimmy Hoffa more so than the Teamsters, but Jimmy Hoffa was a giant narcotics trafficker that never had to account no. for his narcotics trafficking. And that, that gets, people yeah. always talk about him as a gangster, as well as a labor racketeer. Uh, but he was someone that was benefiting greatly yes. from narcotics trafficking and, and allowing those Teamster trucks to be putting cocaine, heroin, marijuana, yeah. pills, and and moving across the country kind of unfettered. Yeah, distribution network. You, yeah. you had a, a national distribution network in place, copious amounts of narcotics, and this is where these connections to New York come into play because a lot of the New York families also have ownership, at least whether it's on paper or not, of trucking industry and labor racketeering connections to the Teamsters. Sanitation. They're, right. They're meeting the Detroit guys. And so in a lot of cases, the Detroit guys were supplying the New York families, especially Big John Ormento, yeah. who was known as a, a as a notorious heroin trafficker. He was a captain in the Lucchese Cases. crime family. But I think what, what sometimes is overlooked is who was his, who were his suppliers. He was getting supplied by the Detroit guys. And a lot of that was being worked out by Angelo Maley, who had the, those Teamsters tie. Or uh, um, uh, at that point, it, it was might have been Vince Maley who was. Well, Vince Maley's tie through the Teamsters was through the steel yeah, hall, yeah, steel yeah, hauling yeah, okay, industry. Right. But he, but he was, I think it was Vince who was the one who was introducing Ormento. Uh, and Johnny Dio and those guys. I think, too, that, was, I think that was Angelo. Was it Angelo? That would have been in like. It would have been like 40s. the fifties. Yeah. 40, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd have to fact check on that. But um, so there are these this network in place between the Detroit guys, Sic Sicily, and 
and New York, and now you have a national distribution network in place. And by Prezio and Quasarano having formal position in the Teamsters, it was basically cover, providing cover for them. Uh, and if you don't think Hoffa was getting kickbacks on <laughs> well, Which is another thing that I think people should know about what played into the fallout between Hoffa and the Mafia. Yes, it was the Mafia wanted him, you know, he was too difficult to puff it, too difficult to puppet. Frank Fitzsimmons, who was Hoffa's vice president and successor, was a lot more malleable. Uh, but part of that <laughs> dynamic of Fitzsimmons being more, quote unquote, malleable was Fitzsimmons being willing to take less money in mm -hmm. kickbacks. Yes, right. For for a variety of things that Hoffa was taking kickbacks for. Yes, right. Yeah, so that, that plays a factor ultimately in his disappearance as well. So the other, we got a little bit of time left. The other two groups um, that we wrote about in the chapter, not only the Partinico group, they're particularly compelling because of the ties to Sicily and the ties to Hoffa. But we talked about the Windsor crew. That's very significant because a lot of this heroin is coming through Montreal and it's making its way south through Windsor. So you have an international border here. And the Windsor crew, at least back then, I don't know about what's going on now. I really don't. But but for decades, Windsor was considered part of it Detroit. It belonged to Detroit. It belonged to the Togos, a really crime family. So all the vice that was going, all the rackets that were going Prince on Joe there. had a nephew in that crew. Yes, that's right. Rocco. Rocco. Yeah, Rocco Pritchell. Right. So um, some of the significant names we talk about uh, for a while, Salvatore, um, or I'm sorry, Giuseppe, Cockeyed Joe, Calinati. Calinati was the was the capo regime in Windsor. And then if you want to go way back, we'll have Danny Juan again at some point. Danny Juan, I like to talk about the real old time stuff, early 1900s, 20s, 30s. His brother- was the boss. Salvatore singing Sam Calinati, <laughs> right, when right. opera singing Mob Don. Yes. <laughs> who, uh, another one of these kind of what ifs, uh, you know, he was, he died at 35 of pneumonia yeah, in 1930. It would have been interesting to because he was one of these guys that was really able to, uh, he was a diplomat. Yes. And was someone that was able to get along with a lot of different factions and a lot of people respected him and he could, make everyone kind of play nice, at least with each other. No, when he dies, that's when the blood, right. that's when the cross town. But, right. So what, I, I, it's always interesting to me to always play the what if game. It was, you know, what if uh, singing Sam doesn't catch pneumonia and, you know, singing Sam is around through the sixties and seventies. Does the Zerilli Toko regime never yeah. really take no, form? It's a great, it's a great, great question. And what is, and, and what is his brother? He had two brothers actually. Yeah. Jimmy, yeah, uh, Vincenzo. What, what, you know, what, what does that mean for them if they're, if Sam was was the Godfather, yeah, right. They they, they may have been even higher, yeah. had more status than and they already did. Kakai Joe's uh, partner or his co capo was a Nofrio Manado. Another who they called No No. Yeah, and No No Manado was a guy that, and both Manado and and Calinati got deported. Yes, in the sixties, Manado had been born in Sicily had come to Detroit fleeing a murder charge. Mm -hmm. When Monado went back to Sicily, he was only, he was deported there uh, in 63, 62. Uh, he only lasted a month or so. The person's family that he had killed, yeah. killed him. Yeah, they, the, so this, this they have this long was, memories. Right, this <laughs> it happened in like the 20s, <laughs> right. and they're avenging it in the 60s. Yeah, because the, if you look at his FBI files, they don't think his assassination had anything to do with the drug trafficking or Detroit stuff. Right. They think it was that vendetta. Yeah, yeah. That, that and Monado, Monado was someone talking about um, how drugs were being smuggled and laundered and uh, was someone that started a trend in Detroit uh, with bowling alleys. Oh, right. Monado... Uh, bought a bunch of bowling alleys, and I think he owned at one point like 15 bowling alleys. Yeah, and then Preziola ended up too. And they would use the bowling alleys to launder the drug money. And yes. I think in some in some cases distribute the drug money. Yes. Or sorry, distribute the narcotics. Yeah, so that, he's an interesting guy too. He was Catalinati's uh, captain. I think, Monat was he married to Cockeye Joe's sister? Or yeah, I, I think, think they were they brother were, they yeah. were brother, yeah. And he was a lab, big labor racketeer before he got deported. Um, and he he's actually one of those guys who starts off on the other side. He starts off 
as like with Perone as like a union buster. Right. <laughs> and then before Hoffa works out this thing where no, we're actually going labor's going gonna, to work we're gonna be, with pro labor. We're gonna be pro labor. <laughs> right. Before that, he was one of those union union busters. So they they first get deported to Windsor, right? Or were they were they I can't remember the time. Were they just in Windsor to set up business or I think they might have been deported to I can't From remember the Calinati and Monado? Yeah. I don't know if they just I thought they were operating pretty freely between okay, maybe, yeah. Windsor and Detroit yeah, maybe they and were, then I'd, ship back to – Yeah. I'd have to go back and look at our – Ship to uh, Europe. Look at our uh, notes and the, the piece that we, we wrote. But, but eventually they are deported to And then Italy. Nick Ciccini, who they called Canada Nick or Canadian Nick, kind of replaces them as, you know, capo regime. His, his reign was pretty short. And then my research tells me up until the – early 80s, from the late 60s to the early 80s, um, a guy named um, uh, Monkey Sam, um, um, oh, what the hell is the, I'm blanking on the last name right now, uh, Miseraka, Sam Miseraka, mm, they called yeah. Monkey Sam, and uh, Monkey Sam was at Jack Toko's 1979 inauguration, hmm. where the FBI was surveilling the... Uh, Ceremony and then pulled everybody over when they were leaving, and they were surprised to find this monkey Sam Mon- uh, monkey Sam Miseraka, who had really been off the radar for the Detroit FBI for quite a bit. He had been around in like the 30s and 40s, but then they had hadn't, and then finally they from uh, informants, one of them being Jack Toko's driver. They found out that Sam Miseraka at that point was in charge of, he was the of, Windsor, of Windsor, and that's why he was at the inauguration. Oh, that's interesting. He died a couple years later. I think he died in 84, 83 or 84. And at that point, my research tells me Tony Powell took over. Took over. He wasn't in Windsor. He was a, a right. downriver capo in Detroit, but he was in charge of whatever right. was and going on. And if you're not from this area, that's very close to Windsor. Any Anywhere, yeah. d- Detroit, downriver, anywhere, yeah. very, very close to, to Windsor. I, and I don't know, post 9-11, I, I think that situation becomes more – Challenging because of Homeland Security and things and, like that. And Tony Powell can, died a couple years ago, stomach cancer. The FBI, when he died, the FBI, um, they didn't say this publicly, but the FBI has made a decision kind of within the Hoffa investigation that their official opinion of Tony Powell is that Tony Powell was the trigger man. On the Hoffa murder. Yeah, so he was he was definitely a significant. It was something that, that they didn't come to that conclusion until the 2010s, right? And based on some things that I, I'm not even sure where they came from and who was talking to them, but the FBI has come to the conclusion now that Tony Palazzolo was the shooter on the. And Hoffa Tony murder. Powell was caught on surveillance saying that, admitting it that they, yeah, that they put Hoffa in a sausage, sausage grinder, grinder, grinder. But all, which, I, which I think he was bullshitting them. Yeah, whoever he was talking to in the surveillance, but that doesn't mean he didn't have anything to do with. Yeah, he still might have been involved in the actual murder. So another interesting angle here, though, is Catalinati. Once he gets deported to Italy. It doesn't take long before he's busted on narcotics charges. And he starts working. <laughs> right. The FBN flips him, which before the DEA was Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And they flip him. And we know the agent well, who was actually the station chief there at the time. And they flip Catalanati and feed him into the Marseille, the, the so-called French, French Connection. Connection. If you've seen the movie, The French Connection. Feed him into that. And the deal is Catalanati says, I won't give up any Italians. But I'll give up the Corsicans and I'll give up corrupt RCMP and, you know, corrupt police in Windsor and Montreal. And he did. Right. They ended up busting between FBN and the Canadian law enforcement. They busted a lot of guys. It, it reminds me. I'm, I'm, um, <laughs> I apologize. I'm off subject slightly. But it reminded me of the same way they took down the the pizza connection through our good friend Frank Panessa. The, yes. The legendary undercover uh, DEA agent was he nailed some uh, Italians like guys that were part of the Scarfo uh, crew mm-hmm. and they got him into an interrogation room and said you know 
you, you can get a you can get a get out of jail free card if you just give up your bosses and they say we're not going to give up the Scarfos we uh, we won't give up the Philadelphia mobsters we'll give you the Sicilian we'll mobsters no problem we got we <laughs> yeah. got no loyalty to them yeah they did right and they did and that ended up uh, yeah. eventually years later yeah. breaking up the pizza connection yeah case. that's how yeah that's how he was able to get introduced to those yeah. guys and so um, another interesting part about this is the FBN agent that we talked to and, and interviewed for this chapter, and we've, we've, we've talked to him about other things, um, is he was in a precarious position because there were a lot of corrupt French officials, and they were protecting the Cors- Corsican heroin, to, you know, Corsican to Sicily pipeline. And so he couldn't trust his French, the peers that he was working with in, in that area. So he had to be very careful. He thought, he thought at one point that the French had been compromised. Yeah. That they were, that they were going to put a contract out on him. The, the, the um, members of the um, French intelligence, I can't think of the, you know, there's like in England, there's M- MI5, MI6, whatever the French version is. I can't remember uh, off the top of my head, but so if you read our chapter, there's a lot of intrigue, not just like gangster stuff, but a lot of political intrigue. And then the last group we'll mention, since you mentioned the Pizza Connection, is the Pizza Connection <laughs> through the Battle of Mentes. Downtown or Battle of Mentes. Yeah, so they, those guys, most of the Pizza Connection, I get it. We think of you know New York, Sicily. Obviously, that's at the nexus of it, even Philadelphia. But there's this overlooked Midwestern part of it. Well, Gatano well. Battle of Mente, who was the, the top of the, the pyramid of the Pizza Connection, the Sicilian Don, uh, had lived in Detroit yeah. in the 40s. And he was at that 57 meeting, too, yeah. in Palermo. Uh, had lived in Detroit, so he, he had ties to Detroit. And then his brother, Emmanuel, a uh, rough manny, yeah. became a capo uh, and ran all of southern Michigan, the Monroe area. Uh, Monroe, uh, Temperance, Bedford. Uh, Adrian Milan, that whole Southern Michigan area was controlled by Don Tano's brother, and then Don Tano's nephew uh, Cesare Battalamente was a uh, a made member of the Detroit Mafia and was a big shot in the construction business uh, until he died in the in the mid eighties. But Don Tano died in prison from his bust in 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 the Pizza Connection. But a lot of that, I, I don't want to say a lot, but a portion. Of that case, mm-hmm. even though, like you said, it's considered a New York case, mm-hmm. a big portion of that case, or at least a, a sizable portion, was was based here in Detroit and then in southern Michigan uh, out of uh, pizza parlors down there. Yeah, and, and so he he had a brother, but also nephews and cousins who were who were Detroit guys. And and the, the more you look into it, you can read our chapter. That plays into Windsor too. Cesare Bellamente and those guys were also. Uh, importing heroin from smuggling heroin over from from Windsor, and uh, he had other nephews like in in Illinois and in, in Wisconsin. Yeah. Or well, his nephew his cousins. nephew down uh, in Southern Michigan was uh, Sam Avola, mm-hmm. whose dad Sam Avola had been a big bootlegger uh, running with the with the Zerilli uh, uh, Toco group in the twenties. Right. So so again, you have this overlap intermarriage and. Uh, Badalamente, they were from Chinese, which historically is very important in Detroit. Not so much now, but before the Tocos Zerillis established their hegemony, there were these different factions, Partinico, Castellamare, um, Chinese, and eventually after the Crosstown Mob War, the to- the the families from Terracini. Well, the, Vi- the Vitalis. Yeah, uh, right. you know, this, this is a different Vitali family. We've talked about 20 Vitalis here. Right. But uh, Peter and Paul Vitali, who were the main Detroit mob Vitalis. Yes. Uh, at least in the majority of Post-World the 20th War century. II. Yeah. Uh, Capos, they ran the Greek town district in Detroit. Uh, they were Chinese. Yeah. And Black Bill and Joe Zerilli and Machine Gun Pete Corrado brought them kind right. of underneath their banner. Yeah, because those families were all from Terracini. Right. Zerilli, Corrado, Toco, Mosheri, you can go on and on, Bomarito, um, Dana. And, uh, but at one point, the, Chines- the Chinese guys were in charge. Their, their ancestor, Bloody John Giovanni Vitale, yep. was the boss, not for long, <laughs> because Tony Dana made, year. Sure, yeah. made sure that didn't last long. But so the, my overall point is, even though we're talking about pizza connection in the 70s and 80s, these ties between Chinese and Detroit go back 
a long a long way. I think that's fascinating. Like the the trans again, that's my primary res- research interest: the transatlantic connection. You know, and as we're wrapping it up, I I want to be clear that obviously here in Detroit with La Cosa Nostra, we're 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 a shadow of what we once were, and. The, the narco super highway isn't necessarily going through Southeast Michigan. No. But my research does tell me that, especially today in the 2020s, there is a good amount of money being made in La Cosa Nostra, in Detroit La Cosa Nostra, uh, on, on drug dealing, on narcotics trafficking. Yeah. I and some of it is coming directly from Sicily. Yeah. Because there are, you know, there's a, a faction of the Detroit mob right now that has direct direct links into the Sicilian mafia. Uh, yeah. Today. Yeah. Some some of the uh, some of the heroin is still coming from places like Southeast Asia and Afghanistan, and that that's where where the Sicilians would be getting it from. Um, so some of that. But I, I would say right now, I think DEA estimates are what it's around like eighty five percent of the heroin now is coming from Mexico. Yeah. But eighty five is not a hundred. <laughs> so I, there's I, still some. Other, there are still other sources. I've just noticed when I, you know, I keep tabs on these guys and who's running around with who, and I've noticed that the guys that are the OGs now, some of the quote unquote BGs. That they have hanging around them, the BGs being baby gangsters, OGs being original gangsters, uh, and I'm talking about the the guys that are running the show. Some of the guys that they have driving them, going to pick up their dry cleaning, bringing them dinner. Some of these guys have have drug rap sheets, mm-hmm. and I, I I don't believe that it's a coincidence. I don't believe that these shot callers are unaware. Yeah. That some of these younger guys they have hanging around them right. have a history in the drug game. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't know background. Yeah. <laughs> again, we don't. I don't want to start dropping names yeah. or whatever. But yeah. you know, I I know that there are guys that are very close to the guys that are at the top of this family right now, and those guys have have pretty um, deep drug histories. Well, and we we didn't even uh, mention also something in our chapter. It's not a big part, but. Even the Jackalones in the eighties, huge, they, they, and they and they they were even <laughs> shipping it to the UK. They were bringing they, it. They were supplying a lot of the cocaine to the UK. We have a lot of shout out to our UK listeners. We have a lot of fans in the UK. You may not be aware of this, but at one point in the eighties, the Jackalone crew were supplying a lot of they the were cocaine moving, they to were, the UK. They were moving cocaine on freighters that were shipping farm equipment. Yeah, industrial equipment. industrial <laughs> farm equipment, and yeah. they were smuggling cocaine in there, and then. That 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 operation got busted up in the late '90s, like right after the game tax case. Yeah, and the star witness in the case against the Great Britain wing of the Detroit Mafia ended up dead mm-hmm. uh, in protection. Yeah, there's some dispute. There's some dispute. Um, it's known that his neighbor or someone that was in his neighborhood killed him. There's questions on what the motive was. Was it just a two neighbors that got into a fight right. over, you know, you're building something and you're five inches onto my property? <laughs> but there's other people that believe this, that the Jackalones sought out someone in this guy's neighborhood that had a history and they gave a contract right, to, to shut him up. To shut him up. Yeah, to shut him up. So, anyhow, we like talking about this, and uh, we know a lot of our big episodes are uh, either New York related or, or bikers, cartels, things like that. But Detroit is our our home base, and so uh, you know, from time to time, we like to record episodes about what what's going on here, or at least historically. And we hope you find it interesting. So, anyhow, thanks for listening. Let me, can I close? Yeah, yeah. Go bit? ahead. Of course. Let's, yeah. a, let's wrap it all around and bring this thing all the way back. And uh, we can hit the siren because uh, after the Italians, uh, you know, stopped dominating the dope game in Detroit, uh, a certain group by the name of Black Mafia family oh, yeah. Yeah. emerged. And uh, they were a Africa, mainly African-American uh, organized crime group based out of southwest Detroit. Uh, and they were led by the Flannery brothers, 
Big Meech, Demetrius Flannery, and his brother Southwest T. And these were guys that were students of the game. Mm-hmm. They were guys that studied Lucky Luciano, studied Meyer Lansky, studied Joe Profacci, studied Joe Zerilli and Tony Giacalone, and based their organization really more so than any other African-American organized crime group. Um, they really patterned it after the Italian. That's why they named it the Black Mafia family. Mm-hmm. And they ended up expanding out of Detroit. Uh, by the time they were arrested in the in the in the mid two thousands, they were they had set up shop in over twenty states. They were controlling well over fifty percent of the cocaine market, wholesale cocaine market um, in in America, and they had outlets all over the. They were like the Walgreens of wholesale cocaine, or Walmart, I mean, or I mean, they were on every <laughs> corner in every major city. Yeah, and uh, when they got busted in two thousand five, uh, called Operation Motor City Mafia, the, the biggest domestic drug dealing boss in DEA history. They confiscated $275 million from uh, BMF uh, connected bank accounts. Big Meech is still serving time for that case. Uh, And I know this was a long preamble to tell you that I'm involved in a very uh, exciting project, a docuseries that's going to be premiering on October 23rd on the Stars Network. Uh, I, I did this along with Stars and 50 Cent and his G-Unit Productions and Alex Gibney and Jigsaw Productions. Alex Gibney is one of the accomplished, real accomplished documentarians in, in our country. And we came together in 2021 and put together an eight-part docuseries, the real story behind the Black Mafia family. And it premieres on October 23rd. And I'm uh, a producer on it. I'm a star of it. And uh, I, I encourage everyone to check it out and, and give us feedback. I'll be dropping every uh, – they don't uh, do binge watching with stars. Mm. Um, they drop it every – so One every every something. Sunday uh, for, for eight weeks, they'll be dropping a new episode of the Black Mafia Family docuseries, which – is called Blowing Money Fast. Yeah, it looks really good. And we 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 uh, promoted the trailer on our Twitter and our YouTube account so people can watch it. And we'll figure out a, a way to do that on, on and Facebook I think and gonna, Instagram I, too. But the trailer looks really good. I think Scott's gonna, in it, by the way, a couple of times. <laughs> I think we're going to have – I'm going to try to have uh, – as the show gets off the ground and maybe uh, midstream – um, maybe after week three or four, I'm going to try to have the director and showrunner, uh, Shan Nicholson, who I work with really closely, come on and, and talk about it. Yeah, and we've had uh, we've had other BMF episodes. If you like that topic, check it out, including Big Meech's former lawyer. From the other side, the IRS criminal division, uh, criminal investigation division agent who led who led the that Motor City Mafia investigation. Um, and also uh, just, you know, anytime we've had, Af- former African American drug kingpins on our show, uh, Doc Davis, Leighton the Beast, Simon, Daryl Chambers. Um, they always talked about they they knew who the Italians were <laughs> back in the seventies and eighties. So they're you know it wasn't just uh, the UK shipping. I, mean, well, I love Daryl. Ch- I love Daryl Chambers' story. I mean this this guy was at the the height of the of the Kronk boxing yeah. empire, and he was. Uh, you know, rising up through the ranks with Tommy Hearns. And in the 70s, he's talking about Emmanuel Stewart taking him to the rooster tail yeah. or taking him to the Motor City Boxing Gym to basically show them off in front of the Italians. Yeah. And he's like, we're fighting. And we got these old Italian yeah. mob guys smoking cigars at ringside, yeah. knowing that we had to impress them. He name dropped Preziola yeah, right. in that in the episode we did with Sammy him, Fana- sure. Sammy Finazzo. Yeah, he was part of that particular Well, Sammy Finazzo, who was a... a Priziola Quasarano guy. Right. He ran all the boxing here in Detroit. He yeah. he owned the Motor City Boxing Gym. And his was it his son or his nephew was part of the Windsor his nephew, group? Was no, his son. Jimmy? His son. Jimmy Fanazzo. Crazy Jimmy Fanazzo was part yeah. of the was a part of the uh of the Windsor crew. Yeah. So anyhow, uh again, thanks for listening. Please follow us on social media. Check out that BMF documentary. Keep spreading the word. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out. Thank you. Thank you.